So our speaker is Aaron Thomas, and he will talk to us about Risk V. Aaron, you have the floor. Is the mic on? Yep. Okay, good. All right, so I'm uh, Arun Thomas, and I'll be talking about uh, Risk Five, open hardware for your open source software. Um, so, how many of how many of you have heard of Risk Five? Uh, that's a good number. Um, how many of you were aware that Risk Five is actually pronounced Risk Five and not Risk B? Uh, that's, that's actually pretty good. Okay. All right. Um, how many of you have played with uh, Risk Five hardware, either or emulated hardware? Um, at all? Uh, that's a few people. And how many of you have read any of the Risk Five specifications? Oh, that's a good number. Okay, so there's people who know things about Risk Five in the audience. So that's cool. Um, so I'll give you a quick overview of my talk. Um, I'll give you a, kind of a. The goal is sort of to give you a tour of the Risk Five ISA, um, the instruction set, where it came from, kind of a quick overview and point you to the specifications. And then I'll talk about the ecosystem, so the hardware and software, the open source hardware and software that are available for RISC-V. And my kind of ulterior, ulterior motive in coming here is to kind of grow the RISC-V community. So I'm hoping I can get you all interested in RISC-V and hopefully uh, contributing to RISC-V and becoming a part of the community. Um, so the talk, I'll start off with a little bit of a RISC-V 101. So a little bit of background on the ISA, where it came from, um, that kind of thing. Then I'll talk about the RISC-V hardware landscape. There's been a lot of kind of interesting developments um, in the RISC-V hardware landscape. We actually have RISC-V silicon that anyone can buy now, which is pretty exciting. Um, and then there's a lot of open source uh, SOCs and chips that are out there. Um, and then there's been a lot of work in the software stack in the last six to 12 months. A um, lot of uh, open source uh, projects have been ported to RISC-V and things have been uh, upstream. Thanks. Um, so yeah, so that's sort of the overview for the talk. Ah, sure, I will do that now, sorry. <laughs> Is that better? Is that okay? Yeah, All right, okay. So, okay. so that's the overview of the talk. Give you a little background and then talk about the hardware and software ecosystem. Uh, so we'll start off with a little RISC-V 101. Um, so RISC-V is an open instruction set specification. It's an ISA. So some of the other, the other ISAs that you may be familiar with, they're x86, ARM, Power, Alpha, MIPS. Um, so RISC-V, um, unlike them, is actually an open specification. Um, so you can build open source or proprietary RISC-V implementations. It's uh, completely up to, do, up to you. It's an open standard, and uh, you can do what you want with it. Um, so if you tried to do this with one of the commercial ISAs, such as ARM or x86, you might get a friendly letter from one of their lawyers. Maybe not so friendly, um, but yeah. Um, so the nice thing about RISC-V being an open ISA is that you don't have to pay any licensing fees, you don't have to deal with any lengthy contract negotiations, and you don't have to deal with lawyers, which I think is a good thing as an engineer. Uh, so. And so, I mean, the licensing fees are a problem, so I mean, if you're trying to build a really low-cost IoT device, the licensing fees can add up to a, a substantial cost of, uh, for your specific device. Uh, contract negotiations can be lengthy. It can take six to 12 months to come to a negotiation with ARM and other uh, vendors. Um, and that can kind of kill you if you're a startup and you've got VCs breathing down your neck. And yeah, no lawyers, so that's good. Um, so I'll give you kind of a quick overview of RISC-V. So RISC-V has a very modest goal. Um, so, and that goal is to become the standard ISA for all computing devices. So from microcontrollers to supercomputers, uh, accelerators, basically any chip that you have in your iPhone, system on chip, uh, we want that to go from some sort of proprietary ISA, there's so many different proprietary ISAs, to a single standard ISA, and that would be RISC-V. Um, and so yeah, it's a modest goal. And so RISC-V is designed for uh, research, education, and commercial use. And uh, research and education were kind of the initial uses because this uh, RISC-V actually came from the University of California, Berkeley. They were using it for research and education. And it's also uh, becoming wi more widely used in uh, commercial sector. People are building products on RISC-V. And uh, if you go to the RISC-V workshops, it's kind of interesting. So I've been to all of the RISC-V workshops. 
And uh, every workshop, there's like more people using Risk Five. There's more companies using Risk Five. There's a lot of interesting research that people are doing with like security extensions and uh, memory models and um, silicon photonics. So there's a lot of interesting Risk Five stuff that's been happening because there's an open standard. Um, so you can blame these folks for Risk Five. These are the responsible parties. So Krista Sanovich and David Patterson are professors at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, David Patterson actually retired recently, so I guess he's a professor emeritus. Um, and their students, Andrew Waterman and Yunsep Lee, are sort of the inventors of uh, Risk V. And so the story goes that uh, Krista and uh, the Berkeley Architecture Group, uh, they were beginning to search for a common ISA for their research. Um, so the way Berkeley works, or at least the Berkeley Architecture Research Group, is every five years they form a new lab to tackle some new problem. And so they were starting up this new lab, and they had used a bunch of different ISAs over the years. And they were like, oh, maybe we should, we should start reevaluating what ISA we want to use for this specific lab for the next five years or so. Um, and so the dominant ISAs that are out there right now are x86 and ARM. And they have a number of problems if you're a researcher. Um, so one is that they're fairly complex ISAs. There's a lot of instructions. If you've actually tried reading the Intel manuals um, or the ARM manuals, they're, they're pretty long. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there. Um, if you ever see Krista Sanovich on the street, you should ask him about uh, x86's AAA instruction and see what uh, reaction you get. Um, so the, the ISAs are just generally too complex for research, and um, so they decided against it. And then you have the IP issues. They're not open ISAs. If you try to tape out an ARM chip, you're going to get sued. So it's not really ideal for researchers. So then they embarked on, so as a result, they embarked on a three-month project to develop their own clean slate ISA in summer 2010. Um, and they continued to work on it over the years and kind of refining the ISA as they taped up more chips and gained more experience. And then four years later, um, three months turned into four years, um, they released the, uh, the frozen uh, RISC-V user specification in May 2014. Um, and then um, as people became, and companies, um, academia, and various people became more interested in RISC-V, uh, RISC-V sort of moved outside of Berkeley and became uh, part of the RISC-V Foundation, and the foundation was formed in August 2015 to kind of caretake the ISA. Um, on a personal note, I actually uh, designed an ISA myself. Um, I embarked on my own three-month project. I co-designed an ISA for a, an undergraduate uh, computer architecture course, and it was not a particularly great ISA. Um, if RISC-V existed then, I would have used it. Um, so, yeah, I think RISC-V would be a good thing for uh, researchers and uh, university lecturers everywhere. Um, so the RISC-V Foundation, which was recently uh, founded, um, it's a nonprofit. Its mission is to standardize, protect, and promote the, uh, the free and open uh, RISC-V instruction set architecture, and also to help build up the hardware and software ecosystem uh, for use in all computing devices. And so, as I said, the RISC-V Foundation is a nonprofit um, based in the U.S., and it has over 50 members, and there's a lot more members that have been joining or are interested in joining, so we expect that to continue to grow. Um, and there's been broad commercial and academic interest. So uh, the last uh, RISC-V workshop, the fifth workshop, sold out. We had over 350 people, and the attendance has been steadily going up. And so that uh, pulled from 107 companies and 29 universities. So we have sort of a broad interest in RISC-V. Um, so some members of the RISC-V Foundation, so you have some fairly large companies, um, so Berkeley, of course, is a member of RISC-V Foundation, but uh, big companies such as Google, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, Huawei, IBM, Mellanox, Micron, Microsemi, Microsoft, NVIDIA, NXP, Qualcomm, Sci-Fi, Western Digital, you get the picture. There's a lot of uh, big companies that are interested in RISC-V and kind of um, evaluating RISC-V for uh, their products and research. Um, other RISC-V members, um, AMD, uh, ETH Zurich, MIT, Low Risk. There's a lot of people who are interested in, in who are members of the RISC-V Foundation. And, it's, uh, and actually, these slides are out of date a little bit. There's been a few people who have been added. So it's, uh, the RISC-V Foundation is doing pretty well. Um, so to go back to the, uh, the RISC-V ISA, um, so RISC-V is the fifth risk, risk ISA from Berkeley. Um, so the early risk research was done at Berkeley and Stanford in like the 80s. And so they did, they've done a number of risk chips over the years. So this is the fifth risk ISA from Berkeley. So it's risk five. So the Roman numeral uh, five or V. And the nice thing about risk five is the modular ISA. So it's a 
simple, it has a simple base instruction set that's fairly small, and then you can layer extensions on top of it. So it has this base plus extension model. Um, and so uh, there are 32-bit, 64-bit, and 128-bit versions of the ISA. And yes, I did say 128-bit. It turns out uh, data center people are interested in 128-bit. Um, so the ISA itself is, the base ISA is fairly small. There are fewer than 50 hardware instructions in the base ISA. So this makes it feasible to implement uh, microcontrollers in really small cores. And as I mentioned, it's designed for extension and customization. So you take a RISC-V core and you basically can customize it to your application. And this sort of comes from the, uh, the base plus extension model. Uh, so to just kind of go over the, the base ISA, so there are different base integer ISAs for each word width. So the 32-bit the uh, RISC-V instruction set, the, name, the kind of naming scheme is RV32I, and I stands for integer. 64-bit uh, is named RV64I, and 128-bit is RV128I. Um, so the way RISC-V, the kind of naming scheme, is that they have these one-letter uh, one letter names for extensions. So I stands for integer, and there are a number of other standard extensions. So M stands for integer multiply divide. A stands for atomic memory operations. F is the single precision floating point um, extension, and D is the double precision floating point extension. And so because all these extensions are fairly uh, widely used and necessary for, to boot up in general purpose operating system, they're lumped into this GISA. So this includes the integers, your multiply divide, atomics, single and double precision floating point. And this is the ISA that you'll use if you want to boot Linux or BSD or something like that. Um, so in addition to the standard instruction sets, you also have, you can build your own um, non-standard um, extensions as well. RISC-V is designed for that. Um, so, kind of the cool thing about the RISC-V ISA is that it's small enough that you can actually fit it on a sheet of paper. Um, so this is a green card for the RISC-V ISA. It's not actually green, but that's what they used to be called back in the day, um, or so David Patterson tells me. Um, so the nice thing is that the base integer instruction set um, is, you can list all the instructions in one column, is basically in the left column. Um, you probably can't read that in the back, but the RISC-V ISA looks kind of like a standard RISC instruction set. You've got loads, stores, shifts, arithmetic operations, logical operations, compares, branches, that sort of thing. So it's pretty familiar if you've done any, like, uh, any hacking on any, like, any RISC ISA in the past. Um, at the bottom, you can see some of the instruction formats. They're designed to be efficient for uh, hardware implementers. Um, the, the rest of the sheet, actually, shows the, uh, the optional compressed extension, so they have some extension for uh, like better code density. And then the back of the sheet has some of the other standard extensions, your multiply, atomics, and floating point, all that stuff. And there's enough room to actually include the, uh, the RISC-V calling convention. So it's a pretty kind of lean ISA. So you can look at the specs for the details. You probably, I'm sure you couldn't read that, but uh, the specs are online. So you can check out the user level ISA specification, uh, version 2.1, to find out the details of uh, what the instructions look like, uh, what do branches look like, that sort of thing, what do loads and stores look like, what kind of arithmetic operations are available. Um, the privileged ISA specification is in version 1.9.1. 1. Um, so the privileged ISA is actually, this is the kind of interface that the OS and firmware uses. Uh, this is actually in development, so uh, version 1.10 will be released soon. Um, and uh, if you want to look at these specification sources, if you want to look at the actual LaTeX sources for these specifications, you can actually find them on GitHub as well um, because it's an open standard. Um, so now that we talked about the ISA as a whole, I'm going to talk about the RISC-V hardware landscape, um, some of the open source uh, SSDs and cores that are available. Uh, so there's a lot of RISC-V cores and SSDs, and they're designed for many different use cases. Um, so some of the main use cases are education, research, and commercial products. And we'll see some examples here. Um, and so you have cores that are really designed for small, low-cost microcontrollers. And then you also have like high performance, like multi-core chips as well. And you'll see more of this over time. Um, RISC-V is still fairly new, and you see a lot more, you see a lot of cores popping up and a lot more people developing RISC-V uh, now than you did even a year ago. And uh, these cores are written in a variety of hardware description languages, or HDLs. Um, so the ones you've probably heard of are VHDL and Verilog, and so there are RISC-V cores, many of them that are written in VHDL and Verilog. Um, some other languages that you may not have heard of are Chisel and BlueSpec System Verilog. And so these are newer HDLs that are a bit uh, higher level and in some ways a bit more 
productive. So the, uh, some of the Berkeley cores, the Berkeley cores are actually written in the Chisel hardware description language. Um, so I'll quickly talk about uh, UC Berkeley and Sci-5 and the relationship there, um, just because a lot of the cores that I'll be talking about originate uh, at Berkeley and Sci-5. So the, uh, the Berkeley Architecture Group, uh, UCB's bar uh, group, created RISC-5. So this is Chris Desanovich and David Patterson's group. Um, as they were developing RISC-5, they also developed a number of open source cores and SSCs for research and teaching. And eventually, the, uh, the RISC-5, so the, the graduate students, Andrew Waterman and Yunsup Lee, like, graduated, and they wanted something to do, so they decided, hey, this RISC-5 thing's kind of cool, and so they decided to found a company called sci Five with uh, Chris Dasanovich, and uh, the, they basically designed custom RISC-V chips for customers, and they're building on their uh, open source cores to do that. So it's uh, kind of cool that they're actually uh, kind of, they're a company that's doing open source stuff, um, and they continue to contribute back to uh, the, uh, the cores that they built at Berkeley. Um, so some of the Berkeley hardware that's out there, so for the uh, system on chip, there's the rocket ship, and it's a parameterized RISC-V SOC generator. Um, because it's parameterized, you can tweak the different uh, knobs. There's a number of knobs that you can tweak. So you can tweak the, uh, the cache hierarchy, the number of cores, um, the TLB size, whether there's a floating point unit, whether there isn't, and it makes it really easy. You basically go into a config file, and you can tweak the core to your needs. Um, in addition to the, uh, the system on chip, there are a number of cores you can choose from. So the rocket core is kind of the standard core that many people use. It's a five-stage pipeline, single issue. Uh, there's also Boom, which is an out-of-order core. It's a research project uh, by Chris Celio at Berkeley. And it's actually pretty cool that you can uh, study the source code of an out-of-order core. There aren't that many out there for, you, for people to study. Um, Berkeley also has a set of educational cores called SOTER. Um, they're, uh, one stage all the way to five stage. Um, and they're designed for simplicity so people can understand them in a university courses. Um, and you can find all the code on GitHub, which is pretty cool. Uh, so quick note about the rocket ship SOC generator. So as I mentioned, it's a parameterized, uh, it's a parameterized SOC generator. Um, and it's written in this uh, Chisel HDL. And so uh, Chisel is this uh, new hardware description language from Berkeley that's an embedded Scala DSL. Um, and so Berkeley uses it and Sci-Fi uses it for all of their cores. And so by using the, uh, the rocket generator in Chisel, you're able to target a few different backends. So you can target a C++ software simulator, which is basically an executable that uh, simulates your, uh, your RISC-V core. You can target an FPGA by targeting the FPGA tools, uh, for instance, your Xilinx, uh, Xilinx uh, tools. Um, or you can, tool, you can uh, target some of the ASIC tools, like uh, Synopsys or, uh, or Cadence. Um, and so the nice thing about the rocket ship SSC generator is because it's parameterized, it's designed for customization, you can use this as a basis for your SOC. It's all open source, and you can kind of tailor it to your application. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, you can either uh, target FPGAs or actual real hardware, and so um, Sci-5 has been doing this, and they've been building on the, uh, the rocket core and the rocket ship SSC generator. Uh, so they have two platforms now, uh, the Freedom Everywhere, um, which is their low-cost 32-bit microcontroller product, and they have the Freedom Unleashed, which is the high-performance 64-bit uh, multi-core SOC. So this is kind of, the, uh, the Freedom Everywhere will run your kind of like real-time embedded operating systems, and the Freedom Unleashed will run Linux, BSD, that sort of thing. And you can find their code on GitHub as well. And so here's the cool hardware. So Sci-5 has these uh, FPGA development kits. And so the RD board, which is about 100 on the left, is about $100 US. And you can, you can use that to emulate the, uh, the Freedom Everywhere, so the microcontroller class. And so they have a little display hooked up. Um, on the right, it's uh, Xilinx VC707, and it's emulating the Freedom Unleashed. So this is the, uh, the, like, the general purpose core that runs Linux. And so the cool thing that you can probably see is that they're running Doom, and they actually did this demo at the last RISC-V workshop. And so it's kind of cool that you can run Doom on a RISC-V hardware. It was kind of a, a pretty cool demo. So uh, RISC-V's uh, kind of making progress. Um, so FPGAs are cool. I really like FPGAs, but um, even more exciting is that there's actually RISC-V silicon now. Um, so the hi Five One board is the first generally available open source RISC-V silicon. Um, 
you, there were people who had RISC-V silicon, but basically they fabricated themselves. So you either had to basically fabricate your own RISC-V chip or have a borrow one from a friend. Um, but now you can just go on crowd supply and buy one for yourself. Um, so the HiFi one um, has the Freedom Everywhere 310 SOC. So this is the microcontroller core. It's Arduino compatible and it supports the Arduino IDE, and it's about $59 US from CrowdSupply. And uh, Sci-5 was kind enough to donate three boards, so I will be giving three boards away at the end of the talk um, for people to uh, play with and hopefully port some more open source software and just uh, do that kind of thing. Um, so the, so the chip in the Freedom Everywhere, uh, the Freedom Everywhere 310, the chip in the Hi-5 One is open source. So all the RTL source code, FPGA scripts, board support packages are all on GitHub, and you can find the documentation board schematics there as well. So that's actually pretty cool. Um, another interesting project, uh, another interesting SOC, RISC-V SOC is the low risk project. And some of you may have uh, seen uh, the talk two years ago here at FOSDEM that Alex Bradbury gave about low risk. Um, so low risk is based at the University of Cambridge, um, and they're aiming to build a really low cost development board. Um, they're, they're, the tagline is Raspberry Pi for grown-ups, um, and it's... <laughs> <laughs> so it was actually founded by one of the founders of Raspberry Pi, so they basically want to create a completely open version of the Raspberry Pi, so that's actually, I think, pretty cool. Um, and it also builds on the rocket ship SSC generator from Berkeley and Sci-5. And they're doing some interesting uh, research things with tagged architectures um, for security and a minion cores for a IO offload. And they have a couple tech notes about this. And I think they're doing some uh, pretty cool stuff. Um, and yeah, you should definitely check out Alex Bradbury's uh, FOSDEM 2015 talk um, and just follow their progress in general because they're doing interesting things. Um, and their code is also available on GitHub. Uh, so the Shakti cores from IIT Madras um, are another set of RISC-V SOCs. Um, so RISC-V apparently is the standard ISA for India, which is kind of cool. Um, and so, as a result, IIT is building uh, six open source cores, and they're like literally going from micro microcontrollers to supercomputers. Um, and so there's a lot of people building a lot of RISC-V hardware there, um, which is pretty cool. Um, and they're using BlueSpec uh, System Verilog as their HDL of choice. Um, and you can find their code on Bitbucket, not GitHub. Um, and so some other RISC-V SOCs and cores that are available, there's Pulpino from the ETH Zurich, um, there's Pico RV32 from uh, Cliff Wolf, and this is meant to be a really uh, size-optimized uh, RISC-V implementation, 32-bit RISC-V implementation. And there are a lot of other uh, commercial and open-source RISC-V cores that are out there, like too many to name. It seems like there's a new RISC-V core popping up uh, every day. I mean, there's a lot of people who are just kind of trying to build their own RISC-V core, which I think is pretty cool, because RISC-V is an open standard. If you're a hacker, you can just go and build your own core, which is, I think, uh, pretty cool. Uh, so if you want to customize RISC-V, I mean, the nice thing about RISC-V is it's designed for customization. The easiest way to do it is to modify the, uh, the tunable parameters of an existing core. So basically, you'll just grab the rocket ship and then play with some of the parameters, disable the floating point unit, mess with the cache hierarchy, etc. cetera. Um, you can implement your own RISC-V accelerator. Uh, you can implement your own RISC-V instruction set extension. Um, if you, chapter nine of the user specification has some information on this. And if you think it's useful enough for, if you think it might be useful to other people, you can submit it for standardization. Um, and if you have a lot of time on your hands, you can implement your own RISC-V core. Um, so yeah, there's been a lot of interesting stuff happening on the hardware landscape. Um, so on the software landscape, uh, in the last six to 12 months, there's been a lot of stuff happening as well. Um, so just to kind of give you an idea of what development platforms are available. Um, so if you don't actually have FPGAs and you don't have RISC-V hardware, you can use a RISC-V emulator. Um, so Spike is kind of the standard RISC-V simulator. Um, so it's, called, it's also called RISC-V ISOSIM. It's kind of the golden model. So every time uh, a specification update is released, the changes go into Spike. Um, in addition to Spike, there's also QMU, which many of you are familiar with. Um, so the QMU has RISC-V support, um, but it's not upstream yet. But it supports, uh, we have support for full system and user emulation. Um, so this is actually pretty cool. Um, so there's another simulator called uh, RISC-V EMU, uh, built by Fabrice Ballard. And you can boot uh, RISC-V Linux in your browser, which is, I think, pretty cool. Um, you should all go do that now and see if you can crash. No, 
don't, don't do that now, but uh, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. Um, so it was kind of funny. So Fabrice Ballard is one of these guys who's just like, I don't know, just super productive. So I get an email from him, and he's just like, oh, yeah, so I built this small project. It's this RISC-V emulator. It, does, it boots Linux in the browser. It has 128-bit support and some other stuff. And even Spike doesn't have 128-bit support. So he, like, I don't know. He's just, I didn't even know he was aware of RISC-V, so it was pretty cool when he was just like, yeah, I got this little project. It does all, does all these things. He's just uh, he's an impressive guy. So yeah, RISC-V EMU is worth checking out. Um, and then we also have an in-progress uh, port of GEM5, which is a full system simu simulator that's used by computer architecture researchers. And hopefully we can get that kind of uh, upstreamed and kind of farther along. Um, so a quick note on Spike and QMU. So Spike is uh, great for prototyping hardware features. Um, I use it a fair amount. I mean, the nice thing about it is it has a really small and simple code base, and it makes it really easy, really easy to add instructions and customize the ISA and everything. But if you're doing software work, I think QMU is probably a better option. The emulation's faster. It's got a number of handy debugging features. It's got better device support. Um, there are a few rough edges in QMU RISC-V now, especially with respect to device support, but we'll be ironing it. We'll, we hope to iron them out fairly soon. So yeah, um, but both are good emulators. Um, with respect to the RISC-V tool chain, um, there's been a lot of progress. So I'm excited to report that uh, RISC-V support will be in bin utils 2.28. And uh, the GCC steering committee has accepted the, uh, the RISC-V port for inclusion. So the port will likely make it into seven, GCC 7.1. So this is due to a lot of hard work by uh, Andrew Waterman and Palmer Dobelt. And uh, thanks to all the, uh, the GCC maintainers and reviewers for reviewing patches. And, making this happen. And so I think once, now that we have the tool chain stuff, I think uh, Linux distros and more of the kind of software enablement stuff will sort of just fall out. Um, the lack of an upstream tool chain, I think, really kind of was kind of slowing down some of the off software efforts. So now that we have upstream tool chains, I think the software uh, enablement stuff will go a lot faster. Um, in addition, there's an LVM port in progress. Some of the patches are upstream. Um, Alex Bradbury uh, from the Low Risk Project is working on this. Um, there are a number of, uh, he's working on code gen patches. They should go out in the next week or two. Um, his goal is to basically make this the cleanest uh, back end. And he wants the RISC-V port to be the kind of exemplar for all the other architectures that come after it. So he's building a really clean port. And so as a result, it's taking a little bit longer. But I think it's, it's going to be exciting when it's done. Um, there's a lot of people who want to have uh, LVM RISC-V. Uh, so we have a lot of RISC-V OS and firmware ports in progress. They're all in various stages. Some are more mature, some are fairly early. Um, so in terms of uh, firmware, uh, the kind of standard firmware right now is there's this Berkeley bootloader, which is kind of a, an initial firmware, but uh, people are working on core boot and UEFI support, um, so that's coming online. For Linux, there are ports in progress for Fedora, Debian, Gentoo, and Yocto Pokey. Um, so Fedora has about like 2,000 packages building. Um, it's a little out of date. Debian has a little over 1,000 packages. Manuel's in the audience somewhere. You can talk to him about uh, Debian. Yeah, so if you want to talk more about Debian RISC-V, you should talk to him, because uh, it'd be great to get more people working on that. Um, there's a Gen 2 port. It's a little out of date, but uh, Palmer will update it as soon as this stuff goes upstream. Um, the Pokey distribution, which is an embedded distribution, has been updated recently, and it's actually a a reasonable platform if you want to do RISC-V uh, hacking. Um, hope it's not upstream yet. We'll have to start pushing that stuff upstream as well. Um, if you're a BSD person, uh, FreeBSD actually has pretty good support for RISC-V. There's a couple uh, things that need to be added, but uh, FreeBSD actually has upstream RISC-V support, which is pretty cool. Um, NetBSD has a port in progress. And there are a number of other operating systems that are, have RISC-V ports in progress. So, and these tend to be more embedded operating systems. So. Uh, SEL4, Gnode, Helenos, Zephyr, FreeRTOS, Artems, Minute. So the software stack is, you know, it's, it's a getting there kind of steadily. Um, and the most exciting thing is that we have a couple operating systems that have upstream RISC-V support, FreeBSD and FreeBSD 11.0, and the uh, Zephyr kernel from the, uh, from the Linux Foundation also has upstream RISC-V support. Um, so that's actually pretty cool. The software stack is starting to come together. Um, there are a number of RISC-V language efforts in progress. Um, for Java, there's, there are people working on OpenJDK and Jikes RVM. Uh, there's a Go port. Um, there's a talk about uh, Go at the last RISC-V workshop. So there's a few Google people who are working on Go RISC-V, which is, they're making a lot of progress in a short amount of time. Uh, there's people working on OCaml and Haskell support for uh, RISC-V. 
Uh, CompCert uh, is a verified, formally verified tool chain. It's also got uh, RISC-V support. Um, there are people from Rust who are interested in uh, getting RISC-V. It hasn't started yet um, because they're kind of waiting on the LVM port. But uh, I think once LVM comes in, we'll see a lot more uh, language efforts kind of getting farther along. So there's a lot of action on the, uh, the RISC-V software front. So what's next? Uh, so we're preparing the Linux kernel, and we will be preparing the Linux kernel, glibc, and QMU patches for upstreaming. So one of the things that's been kind of holding back some of the distros is the lack of upstream Linux kernel support in glibc. Um, so it looks like the Linux kernel support, uh, the patches look reasonable. Um, some of the maintainers have looked at them, and it, there's a few issues that need to be fixed, but once they get fixed, hopefully those patches can go in. Um, and then there's some work on glibc as well. Um, there's also some more, more work on standards. Um, we need to flesh out our ABI specification. Uh, we also need to work more on the privilege specification because it's not, uh, it's not a frozen spec yet. It hasn't been ratified. Um, so there's some more work to be done there. And this will be done sort of in parallel with the, the upstreaming of the Linux kernel and glibc stuff. Um, so as I was saying, once uh, the Linux kernel and glibc get upstreamed, uh, we are going to continue. Uh, it'll make it a lot easier to do Linux distros. So. We'll continue to kind of improve and update our Linux distro support and uh, upstream those changes. And if there are any distro people in the audience, we'd love your help with, uh, with uh, getting RISC-V on your, your distro. Um, and in general, we want to port more software packages to RISC-V. So if you're a maintainer of any software packages, we'd love to work with you to get, add RISC-V support. And yeah, so in general, we need your help to push RISC-V forward. Uh, we hope you'll kind of join the, uh, the RISC-V community and kind of help um, kind of with uh, some of these software tasks as well as some of the hardware stuff and documentation as well. Um, so if you do want to get involved, um, there's some resources that you can check out. So all the codes on GitHub, so that's the GitHub organization. We have mailing lists for hardware development, software development, and development of the ISA. Uh, the RISC-V workshop proceedings are online, uh, so both the slides and the talks. And this is a good way to kind of get up to speed with uh, what's been going on in the RISC-V community. Uh, there's a Stack Overflow, so if you have questions about RISC-V, you can ask them here. Once you learn more about RISC-V, you can answer the questions. That would be great, too. Um, there are a couple articles in Microprocessor Report that sort of describe the RISC-V ISA in general. Um, if you're new to RISC-V, these are worth reading. Um, so the first one kind of talks about the rationale for having an open ISA, and then the second one talks a little bit more about RISC-V particulars. Um, there was an IEEE micro article written by the Berkeley folks about their agile approach to uh, building hardware and mi RISC-V microprocessors. And that's kind of interesting because a lot of what they're doing is they're using open source and the Chisel HDL, a higher level HDL, to build hardware more quickly. Um, so there are a number of upcoming RISC-V events. Um, if you're able to, it'd be great if you could come to some of the events. It's a great way to kind of uh, meet the community and get involved. Uh, so May 9th and 10th, there's the sixth RISC-V workshop. It'll be in Shanghai, China. Um, this is the first time the RISC-V workshop has been outside of the US, so that's pretty exciting. Um, it's hosted by uh, NVIDIA um, and uh, I forget the name of the universe, Shanghai. Yeah, let me remember. Um, and then March 14th to 16th, there's uh, Embedded World, so a number of RISC-V foundation companies will be exhibiting there. Um, April 2nd to 3rd, um, IAT Madras is having a RISC-V conference. And so they've been doing a lot of work with RISC-V, so you'll hear more about their Shakti cores, and then you also hear about RISC-V projects from all around the world. Um, so that should be a cool event. Um, September 8th uh, through 10th, there's ORConf um, in Hebden Bridge, UK. So ORConf is actually an open risk conference, but uh, they've kind of opened it up to uh, RISC-V people, so there'll be a fair number of RISC-V talks there as well. Um, so in summary, RISC-V is an open instruction set specification. Um, you can grab it, you can do what you, you can build proprietary cores, you can build open source cores. Um, you don't have to worry about getting sued, um, which is good. Um, but uh, it's, and because it's an open instruction set specification, there's a lot of open source cores that are available. Um, so there's several options. I talked about the rocket ship, low risk. Uh, there are a number of other options that are available as well. I just highlighted a few of them. Uh, the RISC-V software stack is steadily coming together. Um, Things are getting upstream, distros are happening, and we'd love your help there. And in general, we're looking for contributors um, all across the, uh, the hardware software stack. Um, so uh, the takeaway is that you should hack on RISC-V, and I hope to see you at uh, one of the many uh, 2017 RISC-V events. Um, thank you.
Sorry. Uh, could you speak? Yeah, so this is one of these things that's sort of difficult. Uh, so I think the question was about uh, what peripherals are available in the SOC. And the bus. So Axie. Right, so this is a question about specific implementations. Um, so for the rocket ship implementation, uh, the bus that uses Axie, um, and they have, I don't know, they have spy devices, PWM, they have, I don't, I actually don't, can't enumerate all, they have some GPIOs. So this is one of these things where there are some devices, but there's gonna be more work that needs to be done. And so I think the Free Chips Foundation, the Fozzie Foundation, LibreCores, I think together we'll have to work together. Um, so there are some peripherals there in the SOC. I don't remember all of them offhand, um, but there definitely will need to be work there. Um, there are no GPUs, for instance. That's difficult. Um, but for a lot of the embedded peripherals, a lot of some of that stuff is there. I think we have USB now, maybe. I don't know. So that's an implementation question. And so it depends on the implementation. Um, so the ISA, I mean, really depends on the implementation. So the Hi5 board is, uh, can cl be clocked at 320 megahertz. They're using a TSMC 180 nanometer. Um, the Freedom Unleashed platform, they've quoted, they're gonna use, I think, TSMC 28 nanometer. You can clock that at 1.6 gigahertz above, 1.6 gigahertz and above is what they've quoted it as. Um, so it sort of depends on the implementation. Um, yeah. Um, actually, do you want a board? All right. Uh, anybody else? <laughs> yeah. You. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the question is, um, so the next risk five workshop that's outside, the first one that's outside the U.S. is going to be in uh, China and sort of what about Europe, I think was the question. And Yeah, so actually we were hoping to come to Europe um, just because of the timing. We, I mean, there were a couple venues that were discussed, like uh, Cambridge and Zurich, and it was mostly a timing thing. Um, so we're definitely gonna come to Europe. Um, it was just the, the dates that we've set up were kind of difficult with university calendars and things like that. Um, there will be some RISC-V meetups that uh, we haven't scheduled yet, but we're hoping to have a couple of RISC-V meetups. Um, there'll be smaller events in Europe, but uh, yeah, we definitely wanna have a foundation event soon um, in, uh, in Europe, um, probably I assume, I think the next one will probably be in the U.S., but hopefully sometime next year we can get to Europe. But there are a lot of other, we'll definitely be holding smaller risk five events. Um, sorry, what was that? Uh, I don't know about this year. So the question was, will some of the risk five founders come to uh, ORConf? So, yeah. So, so they've been to ORConf in the past, uh, like two years ago, they gave talks there. I don't know if it'll happen this year, but I'll see if they can make it, or some other RISC-V people. But yeah, I think in general, we should get more RISC-V people going to ORConf events and coming to Europe. Um, you get aboard too. Um, does anybody else want to? Yes, here. Where? Oh, yeah. The guy with the microphone. You got a thanks. microphone, all right, yeah. <laughs> so now that you've tackled the CPU, and thanks, uh, how about uh, pretty please with sugar on top, start tackling the GPUs? Yeah, yeah. Please. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, so the GPUs are hard. Um, there are some, 
I know there are some academic efforts that are building their own GPUs. Um, I think there's, for the, I think the Risk Five Foundation and some of the other like Fozzie Foundation, and there's a new Free Chips found, project that's been uh, founded, and basically they're kind of taking over some of the, uh, they're, they're playing the foundation role for the rocket ship. So th their goal is to build more um, open source IP blocks. Um, I think the GPU is going to be hard. Um, we need to get a lot more people kind of working on that. So I think it's probably going to require collaboration between all of the open ho hardware projects. Um, but there are a couple of academic projects that look promising. Which ones? I don't remember, honestly. Um, Yeah, I don't remember where they're from. Uh, yeah, Open GPU University. <laughs> I'll see. I'll I'll ask some people about it because I remember hearing about a couple that seemed kind of promising. Um, I mean, the other thing you can do is just post to the Risk Five mailing list, um, hardware dev, and just get a discussion started. Um, it's not a priority for us right now. There's a lot of other things we have to work on, but uh, I think as a the open hardware community as a whole, together, uh, we should we should definitely tackle that. Um, yeah, GPUs are hard. Open GPUs are hard, too. Yep. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get you afterwards. <laughs> is there, uh, is there beside the instruction set that you've shown here today, do you have any ideas about something like SIMD? SIMD, okay, so there's a vector extension that, uh, that Krista is working on. So Krista apparently has worked on like vectors, like vector machines, kind of like his whole career. So he and some other old school vector people are really excited about putting like a, a vector proposal together. Um, so there's been some discussion about it, um, but it's gonna take a while to kind of standardize. Um, if you're interested in that, uh, you could uh, talk to people on the ISADEV mailing list or we have, uh, we also have working groups at the, uh, the Risk Five. Uh, foundation meetings. Um, so there are people who are interested. Krista in particular is all about vectors, so something will happen. Uh, I can't promise anything in terms of timeline. Yeah. Um, someone here had a question. Yeah. Or just in the board? Oh, sorry. So you want to buy a Sci-5 chip? Yeah, just a chip, not a board. Is, are they available for um, your own designs, or? I'm sure if you email Sci-5, they'll sell you some chips. Okay. Um, <laughs> so so yeah. you don't really know. Yeah, I mean, so what they, their business model basically is that they'll do custom design for you. So I'm sure they'd be happy to sell you chips if you have some sort of board that you want to build or something. Um, it's a it's a pretty nice chip. Uh, about the openness, so you mentioned. Uh, a lot of times that it's open and there are no lawyers involved and uh, uh, there's nothing to be afraid, just copy the implementation of the course and uh, edit. What's the license? And there, so, are there any patent issues? And yep, is there yeah. one license for all implementations? That's a good question. Um, so the question is about licensing. Um, so, uh, the, so the license depends on the implementation. Um, so the Berkeley core is under the BSD license. Um, sci is licensing some things under Apache. Um, other people are using the ISC license. There may, I'm sure there's some copyleft like GPL hardware as well. Um, so it's sort of up to the project to decide what license they want for their specific implementation. It can be proprietary. Yeah, absolutely. It can be proprietary as well. So if you're a company, and there are several companies doing this, um, because it's just a standard, you can implement your proprietary risk five chip, and that's completely fine. Um, yeah. Is that everybody? Uh, hi. Uh, what peripherals are, are available on the Risk V MCU uh, that they're selling now? Or yeah. Okay. So. Like SPI, I squared C. Yeah. So I, it has some SPI. It has some GPIOs. It has some PWMs. Uh, I don't remember everything else. The crowd supply page will have all the details. But it's Arduino compatible, so you can put like Arduino shields, Arduino shields in there. Um, so there's a couple. Adafruit shields that they use in their demos. Um, so I don't remember all of the details, but if you go to the Crowd Supply website, it has all the details and it's the data sheet. Um, yeah. Sorry, there's a question back there. Uh, so the question was are there um, implementations using multi threading? Um, so there are multi core implementations. Are you talking about like symmetric multi thread, like hyper threading? 
time, but having maybe several program counters, several uh, registered banks, and you can select which yeah. program count to use every cycle. Fine grained yeah, multi threading. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, they may exist. I'm actually not sure. I don't think the rocket ship does that. I think the rocket ship is just multi core. So it doesn't have like hyper threading or anything like that or SMT. Um, questions back there? Okay. Okay, so the question was, uh, what's the risk? Are the specifications frozen? And what's the risk about uh, if you buy hardware that it doesn't match the specification? So the nice thing about, so the specific, uh, the Hi5 one board uh, only implements the microcontroller spec. So, um, or it's a microcontroller, so it doesn't implement the, uh, the privileged specification. So the stuff that it implements is frozen. Um, but the, uh, the privilege spec is under development. So um, hardware that is using the privilege spec, um, there actually isn't any generally available, but uh, that could be a problem there. But we're hoping to standardize the privilege spec um, this year. So hopefully none of the har I think it's unlikely that hardware will be out that uh, doesn't match the spec that's generally available. I mean, you can build your own test chip. Several people have built test chips with uh, the earlier version of the, uh, the privilege spec. Um, so two things. Um, as for, you mentioned GHC, uh, the Haskell compiler, it's actually pretty easy to uh, add basic architecture support to GHCs. You, you just have to like edit two lines of Haskell code or something and like uh, autoconf. Uh, I've actually been doing that in the past quite a lot for like uh, Super H, which is like now being redeveloped as an open source architecture. Um, and the second thing in general is, so in, I'm a Debian developer, and in Debian we have this project called uh, Reboot Strap. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of it. It's no. basically like an automated system which allows you to uh, cross bootstrap a new architecture. So you, it's like it's an, an amazing effort, and you, you just run a simple script, and in the end you end up with like the minimum set of packages cross-built for the new architecture that you need to be able to bootstrap and meaning that you can you know, build it on the, build, build, uh, the Debian build D infrastructure. And the nice thing is that it's constantly running on a Jenkins job. So we are like basically verifying all the time like if, if something you know, is cr cross bootstrappable or not, or a package is cross buildable. And so with this mechanism, we are actually you know, fixing all the bugs and, and making you know, new architectures built on Debian. And we are, of course, upstream all that stuff. So, and uh, open risk is included in that. that sounds cool. Uh, Manuel, I guess you know about it. All Sorry? Right, so, I, so I was talking to Manuel because he's done the Debian Risk V port. I was like, who? Ma Ma Manuel. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, so he's, he's our Debian guy. Uh, <laughs> can I get a board? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think uh, these two guys get one. If I have more, yes. <laughs> Um, there was a question there, yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. So there, there's a question about whether there's a certification program to make sure that the, uh, the standard is followed. Um, so that's actually something the, the Risk Five Foundation is working on. Um, so it's kind of key that we're building up these compliance tests, and so we need to make, and that's kind of like going to verify that you are meeting the Risk Five standard. Um, there's also been some work on building a, a formal specification of the Risk Five ISA, which is a little bit different, but related. Um, so that's in progress, um, but it's still pretty early. Um, 